Nikita Koloff, the Russian nightmare, no, the devil's nightmare here from It's Time to Man Up, challenging men to step into their true manhood. Your chosen Truth Network podcast is starting in just a few seconds. Enjoy it, share it, but most of all, thank you for listening to the Truth Podcast Network. This is the Truth Network. All right, for my YouTube channel, If Not For God with Mike Zwick, just like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll be alerted when we have our next video. Welcome to If Not For God, stories of hopelessness that turn to hope. Here is your host, Mike Zwick. If Not For God with Mike Zwick, so fun to be back in the studio with my friend Mike. And we got a big event coming up. We do, November 4th, 5th, and 6th, and the field next to Cox Toyota. We have a big time revival going over there. And I don't know if you guys remember, back in 2016 and 2017, there was a huge tent revival right there. And it was with a guy named C.T. Townsend. I don't know if you remember him or if you've heard of him, but he he was there. It was supposed to last for maybe a week or two, and it ended up lasting for months. It was on national news, on CBN, on all that. And so we're actually going to be doing it for three days. Um, we don't have those deep pockets. <laughs> but, Who knows if God wants to make it happen? If he wants to make then. it, but yeah. So it's going to be those three days. But, you know, a lot of people have been praying for a revival, uh, Robbie, but, um, you know, we've been praying for it as well, but <clears throat> I'm excited to actually have the chance to do something like this with you beside you, uh, face to face. How about you? Yeah. I mean, how amazing that God provided the venue. He provided the opportunity. He provided the timing mm -hmm. and, and then he's provided some amazing people to come. Right. I mean, it, 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 Cameron as, Horner, <laughs> Joanna Horner, his mother. Yeah, if you remember Cameron, he, he used to have a Disciple Magazine here on the Truth Network. Young man that was hurt in a diving accident, not unlike Jer Johnny Erickson Tata, has a incredible testimony of how God saved his life when he was underwater. But on top of that, oh, the life and the life he's given, because I've always said, you know, Cameron has a rolling platform. <laughs> 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 and when people see, you know, how hard he fights for his life, um, and the joy that he has, um, you know, he, he's an amazing speaker and what a, you know, what a man of God and, and his mother, of course, who went through that entire thing with him and, you know, they've gone to Ireland to share the gospel. They've gone to India to share the gospel. I mean, they, they, they are an amazing, amazing family and so excited to have them with us as well. And the name of the revival is actually revive us again. And it comes from Psalm 85, six, and it says, uh, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? And what I've heard uh, is that a revival is where Christians, people who are already followers of Christ or church members, uh, get revived and get enthusiastic and get excited about the Lord and, and get closer to the Lord. And the Lord draws closer to them and they draw closer to the Lord. And then what an awakening is when the Christians have already been revived many times. And then the people who are non-Christians— uh, start turning to Christ in droves. And so that is certainly our hope and that that's certainly our plan. But I tell you what, there, there's a few things, there's several things that have to happen with a, if, if there's going to be a revival. And we talked about this the last time where it says, uh, I think it's Psalm 127 verse one, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. And so unless we really start to pray for a revival as Christians, um, it, it may not happen, but we've really, really got to be deep into prayer uh, before this thing happens. And, and you had a story, Robbie. I, I heard you preach it. I believe it was a Presbyterian church in, in Durham one time, and you told a story about prayer and seagulls in the ocean. <laughs> well, interestingly, I don't recall the story that you're talking about, but I, what I want you, if you don't <laughs> okay. mind, um, <clears throat> And I'm hopefully you'll tell that story in a second. But before you do that, read that verse again for me. The one you said in, in, in Psalm 78, the one you just quoted. No, there's Psalm 85, I mean, Psalm, 6. It Psalm, says, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Okay, so that's what I wanted. So your people, in other words, note the fruit that happens 
of the revival, which most people, you know, think that a lot of things happen as a result of the revival. But did you hear what it just said? So that your people, right, that are called by your name, that would be the Christians, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> would rejoice. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a really neat thing when you think about joy, because in his presence is fullness of joy, right? Mm -hmm. And, and and the Song of Solomon, all throughout it, there's a there's a phrase that's repeated many times. It says, "You know, I am my beloved, and he is mine. He grazes among the lilies." Well, I don't know if you know that the word lily in Hebrew is the same word as joy or to rejoice. Okay, and, and so when you think about a lily, what is it? It's a flower. Right. Mm -hmm. And you might even know that in the second chapter, it says, you know, I'm a lily of the valleys. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea is a flower is it's is it's blooming. Right. It looks pretty happy. Right. It's, yeah. it's rejoicing. And so what can happen with a flower is it can be pollinated. Just saying it's a very fruitful thing yeah. that happens as a result of joy. And so what happens in a revival is what is explaining from my point of view is that people get such an amazing, like when you look at that person, they've got that white look like Moses had when he came down off the mountain, man, they're so happy. They can, they're beside themselves because they're sick with love again. We're just talking about being just so delighted in Jesus that everybody's going, what's up with these people? That's right. And that's what spreads. And, and so here's the opportunity, not just, you know, obviously for the gospel to spread and whatever, but the people are men. I mean, they are absolutely in a, in a, point of joy so that we are rejoicing again. And again, I say rejoice because therein is where Jesus wants to be. He wants to graze among the lilies. He wants to pasture right there among those who are absolutely so delighted in their relationship with Christ. It's unbelievable. Yeah. There was a guy uh, years ago and he was part of a business. His name was Agar. And he said, he, he used to send this email out and he said, you can't sell a dream if you're living a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I thought about it. It's you know, when we've talked about this a little bit on the last show, but you know, if if you're just as depressed and miserable as as the world is, why would they want to follow you? I mean, there there's I'm not and 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 I'm not trying to belittle depression. I'm not trying to belittle tough times because we've always had tough times. I mean, I we, we've all gone through tough times, you, me, all of us, but I do believe that as a Christian, we don't stay there because we realize of the we realize the hope that we have within us and we realize that uh, James 4.14, 4, it says, don't you know that your life is like a vapor that appears for a moment and then it's gone. So no matter how tough of a time that we're going through, we know that we have the love of Christ and we know that when we die, we're going to go to heaven, man. We're going to heaven. And it's, it's a be, heck of a lot better than this place. It's going to be awesome. And so it, it boils down, it's really cool. The 119th Psalm, it says, thy word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. The point of that that I want to get to is that the truth is foundational and it's going to stand. And if you believe the truth that Jesus is coming back, you believe that all mm -hmm. things work together for good, you believe that Jesus really is the answer and really is in his presence, his fullness of joy, you believe those things, then all the lies will crumble. Mm -hmm. Because the opposite of that statement I just made that is his his word endures forever is that what doesn't endure is lies because uh -huh. things that are not built on a good foundation and not mm -hmm. a sol solid foundation are going to crumble. So you have a relationship right now and that person's madder than anything at you because they believe a lie. Yeah. I bet you got one of those in your life. Here's the great news. That lie will crumble. Yeah. It, it has to because it's not based on the truth. That's right. And, and whatever the situation is, as we believe in the word of God, as we believe in the truth, then we know that the lies have got to crumble. Yeah. And so as we get closer to Christ, we we actually obviously fall more in love with him, more in love with his word. Mm -hmm. Then the truth becomes more real to us. That's right. The lies crumble around us. And where do we get to? Joy. Yeah. Rejoice, right? Yeah. And, and there's a place where we can be fruitful. And that's the idea. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we definitely want to be, you know, there was something that I, that I've, uh, there's a passage that I always thought of. And it's John 17, and it starts in verse 8. It says, Jesus was saying this. He says, For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. He's talking to God, his Father. For they are yours, and all mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. 
Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And just a snapshot photo of that passage tells me, Jesus is saying, he says, I've, I'm praying for the ones that I know, or I'm praying for the elect. Um, it's just interesting. He said, I'm not praying for the world. I'm not praying for those who I know are not going to follow me. He says, but I'm, I'm praying for the elect. And so kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with the revival. A revival is where the elect, the Christians, are revived. And so one of my favorite little uh, quotes was by uh, John Wesley. He says, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. Yeah, I love, uh, I, I, you know, Randy Akron, I'm trying to think if I got his name right. Anyway, he, he, he talked about all the wonderful re-words, right? Like redeem and resurrection. They all start with that re and revival. In other words, you, you know, that all these re are what Jesus is doing because in order to get to where we hope, you know, that, not where we hope, where we know that mm -hmm. God's going to turn the, well, we hope and we know mm -hmm. that, that the Lord's going to turn all this around, but there has to be sort of an order, a recreation, That's right. right? We had creation, but now he's going to have to redo some recreation. Mm -hmm. And in order to, for that to happen, we got to see a lot of things fall apart That's because right. in order to clean out the garage, you know, you got to, in fact, I was telling my daughter, actually yesterday I took my daughter to lunch and she was talking about a relationship we we're struggling with. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, well, it's kind of like a pimple, you know, that they, they get real red and they hurt a lot before they, before they burst open and you get all the poison out, right? Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> and so the world, to some extent, unfortunately, you know, a lot of times gets pretty swollen and pretty painful, you know, before the poison comes out. But at some point in time, that sucker hurts bad enough and it gets squished. That's right. You know, it, it, it's funny. I, I was talking to Cliff Sutton. And they actually let me come and share at their church, just like Jesus Ministries over in Burlington. Great little church. If you ever get a chance uh, to go over there and visit them, go and visit them uh, the Sunday morning. I think they actually do something on Thursday nights as well. Uh, but I was talking to Cliff, and, and one of the things that Cliff was telling me is he said, you know, it was Cliff and Wayne, Wayne Dozier, your friend. Oh, yeah. And we were on the phone, and, and Wayne said, Mike, he says, you want a revival, huh? And I said, yeah. He's like, well, if you look in the Bible— a lot of times before there's a revival or people turn to the Lord, things have to get really bad first. You know, it's like, you know, in, in our, in our friend, Jeff Hoover always says, he says, you know, the Lord always tries to bless, bless us first. He would try to bless Israel. He said, but you, you would see that when things went really well for them, all of a sudden they started turning away from the Lord. But when things got really bad for them, then they would turn to the Lord. And, and so, a great example of that is, you know, if you look at John chapter three, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he's saying that you must be born again, he actually is referring back as where Moses lifted the snake up on the, up on the, uh, up on the staff. Uh, he was referring back to numbers 21 where the people started to complain. They started to rebel against God and they were bitten by these terrible poisonous snakes and uh, that, you know, they were crying out to God. OK, they yeah. were crying out to God and that, you know, crying out to Moses. And so Moses asked the Lord, what can we do? And, and, and the Lord told Moses, he says, if you take a, a bronze snake or a copper snake and you put it up on a pole, he says, anybody who looks to that snake who has been bitten will live. And in John chapter three, he says in the same way in the Old Testament, you look to the snake. But in the New Testament, what it says is that anybody who believes on him. Anybody could be because we've all been bitten by the snake of sin. Scripture says in Romans 3 23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it says, you know, we've all sinned. You know, that sometimes the toughest person to reach, Robbie, is the person who thinks they're good. Oh, I'm um, good, right? Right, right. And, and it's a fascinating thing when you really study that passage, something came to me a few years ago that really what Jesus is saying is that serpent on the pole mm -hmm. is, is Jesus. Mm -hmm. He became sin. Like mm -hmm. what? Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. He became sin. And, 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 and it's really a crazy kind of thing, but it's interesting. Again, at the, in the Song of Solomon, there's this really interesting passage where it says, Daughters of Zion, you know, 
come behold, right, the crown that King Solomon's mother crowned him with on the day of his espousals, on the day of the rejoicing of his heart. Mm -hmm. Well, what crown did the people of Jerusalem put on Jesus? The thorns, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and so the crown that, that Jesus was crowned with, and who, who exactly, you know, when it says his mother, that means his people. So his, who is his people as far as right now today? His people is Robbie, mm. right? So who put that crown on him? Mm. I needed him to, right? Mm. I needed him to, to be up on that pole. I needed him to be my sin in order that I wouldn't have any sin. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you look God at God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Right. He's on there. And so when we look upon the one that essentially we put there, um, there there's no way around it. That oh my goodness, and and therein lies the, the 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 part of that verse that just jumps out at me at the day of the rejoicing. You know, we call it Good Friday, mm -hmm. but it's it's like Solomon knew as he was writing this prophecy that Jesus would rejoice in the fact the day of the rejoicing of Jesus's heart. The mm -hmm. day uh, that re, here's that re word again. He was rejoicing, yes, because he knew that Mike Zwick, Robbie Dillmore, those that he originally created to, to spend eternity with him, he knew that this is it, man. I, I've done it. You know, it's finished. We're, we're going to be together forever. And he did it. He did it. Mm -hmm. and, and when I hear him in, in, in John 17, where he's saying, I, I, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Uh, but all that you have given me, what it reminds me of, and this is kind of what I'm thinking of, is that there are people who have not yet surrendered to Jesus who are alive now, but he knows that they're going to. So for me, when I read that, it says he's praying for them. Even though they haven't surrendered their hearts or their lives to Jesus yet, he knows something's going to happen in their life where they're going to say, Lord, <laughs> I surrender all. All to him, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Right, and, and that's the beauty of hitting bottom, right, is that only then do we get a chance to see who we really are because I think... My, I love Spurgeon put it. He's got this devotional that actually James Banks gave me, my good friend, at the Presbyterian Church, and we're sure. still going to find out about that seagull story. So don't okay. <laughs> don't give up on us because Michael's going to tell us the story. So the I seagull read. story. <laughs> you said the seagull story was this. Um, you said you were talking about prayer, and you said if you ever see the seagulls when they're at the beach, the wind is going, and you said sometimes the wind is going, and they're just kind of sticking their wings out. Do you remember now? I do. And and that they're not putting any effort in at all. They're just kind of floating out there, and the wind is holding them up. And so we can try to fly on our own. We can try to go on our own. But when we pray, we're like those seagulls that are being held up by the wind. Oh, I remember that. I'd forgotten it, but it was really good. But in this, in this, and, I, and this, this fits well with what I was going to say. In Spurgeon's book, which is called Morning and Evening, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you the date on it, but he was talking about that when we become aware of our own depravity, occasionally it's like you've got all this sin down in your soul. I know I do. And every once in a while something will stir it up, and then all of a sudden I'll get a look at my anger, my road rage, whatever it was that happened to me that like, oh, man, I need Jesus as bad as I ever needed Jesus. That's right. That's right. That it's at, at that point that we lose another one of those places that we're covering ourselves with our anger, we're mm -hmm. covering ourselves with our fear, we're covering it, and we're replacing that cover with the blood of Jesus because when you really think about it, what Adam said, God said, where are you at, buddy? <laughs> he said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the story of most of my life. That's right. In so many different ways. I was afraid because I was naked, mm -hmm. and so I hid. Mm -hmm. And... and there's a million ways I do that through anger, right? Yeah. I, I, I can I can do that through indulging in almost anything, yeah. right? I'm just yeah. hiding. You know, my wife is driving me crazy, so what do I do? Go bury my head in the TV. I was afraid because I was naked. I didn't know how to deal with, right? right? And rather than going to Jesus and going, yeah. you know, Lord, I'm in trouble here. Yes, yes. And, and, you know, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Or many people use alcohol. Many people use drugs. Many people use sex. Many people use pornography. Um, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, I've, I've, I've definitely dealt with some of that stuff too. 
Um, and you know, one of the stories though that I'm that I'm reminded of when we're talking about this was uh, John Newton. He was the guy who wrote Amazing Grace, right? Right. The uh, that when he was older in his 80s or something like that, that he would uh, he was dealing with these struggles and these sins, and he thought that after 20, 30, 40 years of, of, of being a close Christian, drawing close to Christ, that he wouldn't have to deal with this stuff anymore. And we're talking John Newton here, you know? We're talking John Newton here. Amazing. <laughs> gra- yeah. And, and, and so he had some time with the Lord, some quiet time with the Lord, which is a good thing. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, which you do every morning, Robbie, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but he had some time alone with the Lord, and he said he felt the Lord had told him, the reason why I still allow you to struggle with these things is so I'd, is because the Lord was telling him, I'd rather you struggle with these little things than struggle with a much bigger thing, and that's the sin of pride. Yeah, it really, really is. You know, that, that again, when we get a good smell of our inner cesspool, <laughs> the way that, 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 yeah. that uh, C.S. Lewis put it, when mm-hmm. you get a good whiff of your inner cesspool, like, man, am I still, yeah, you are. And, and, and you know, the beauty of it is, is it is a reminder that, Wow. And, but also it, it, it helps people relate to you. Mm-hmm. Right. So I was, you know, my <laughs> big evangelistic message this year, I don't know if I told you the story. Yeah. I was at the car show in, um, I, I'd spoken at the pro bull riders event, which was really a neat thing. And God had given me the message like a week and a half before that. And I was so prepared. I was so thankful that God gave me that message, blah, blah, blah. The week before the car show, I was supposed to give a five minute evangelistic message to all these people that came to the shark car show that weren't Christians. Mm-hmm. And so I started praying like you would, like, God, give me something, yeah. right? And he, he, nothing, I hear crickets. So the night before, like, it's Friday night, and, I've, and I drive into Atlanta, and I'm staying up in a hotel room, and, and I'm praying, and it's like 10, 11 o'clock at night. I'm, I'm reading my Bible, searching, God, you got to give me something, because i got to give a five-minute talk tomorrow, and that five minutes harder to do than 30 minutes, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I, I fall asleep reading my Bible. Well, I have the most lurid, horrible um, dream Okay. that it certainly awakens my inner cesspool. Okay. And it smells horrible. (laughs) (laughs) And I wake up, you know, like, Uh I can't believe that I'm, you know, here I am after all these years, same exact thing that Noon went through. It's me, and this was three three weeks ago, right? Right. And I'm like, I can't, I was like, Jesus, you know, I'm supposed to speak here in a few hours, and and you see where I'm at. And he comes, and, and he says, you know, Robbie, we need to get tight. We need you. You know, you need me more desperately than you ever did, don't you? Yeah. And I really did. Wow. I not to share with these other people. I needed him for me. That's right. That's right. And, and so we had a really amazing time of communion. Jesus and I did. And I went back to sleep. And guess what? I had the exact same dream. Mm. Only this time, it didn't awaken the inner cesspool. Okay. And, and this time I remembered the name in the night, O oh Lord, and kept your law. Okay. Yeah. And, and I woke up and I felt so close to God. Yeah. It was like four in the morning, my normal time to wake up. And I'm getting ready to prepare for this message. I still don't know what I'm going to say. That's right. And so I start to say the Lord's Prayer. Yes. Like I usually do in my beginning of my prayer. And I said, Our Father. And I went, because I had my arm around Jesus. I really did. Mm-hmm. Think about it, Mike. I said, Our Father. Mm-hmm. And I'd never done that before. Like, oh, it's me and you's dad, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our Father, which art in heaven. Yeah. And as I finished the prayer, he said, now do you know what you're going to say? Yeah. And he said, and I was like, are you telling me I'm supposed to share the dream? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so my five-minute message that morning to the crowd yeah. was I shared my struggles from the night before mm. and then shared that story about the eagle, right, that eagles can look directly in the sun. And That's so. Right. If we can fly towards Jesus, yeah. we're like eagles, right? Yeah. That nothing that Satan can't get anywhere close to us because, you know, we're your accusers. Yeah. And so you need Jesus so you can be like eagle and you can look directly into the S O N. That's it. And there and, and there's the deal. That's it. And there was there was actually when you're saying that there was a day, it was last week or so, where I said I'm gonna fast until five o'clock or so. I was praying about the revival that's coming up, but I uh, I said, Lord, what is it that you have to tell me? And during that day, it was, and there was somebody who had spoken into me, but, you know, it was Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for it is by grace that we are saved through faith, not of ourselves, so that no one may boast. And so sometimes even I can kind of get to that point where, oh, I'm telling everybody else what they need to do, blah, 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 blah. 
but I'm just like you, man. I, I need a Savior more than anybody else. And if, if you're listening today, and if you don't know the Savior, Jesus Christ, or the Son of God, um, I just want to pray that you ask him right now to forgive you of your sins. Just pray with me now. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I know I'm a sinner. I repent, which means I ask you to for, forgive me, and I turn away from my sins, Lord, and I turn to you, and I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And so if you prayed that prayer, we, we'd love for you to, uh, to get in touch with us. Um, and if you prayed that prayer as well, I think it's really important that you come to this revival. It's going to be in Burlington, North Carolina, next to Cox Toyota, the big field. There's going to be a huge tent. You can't miss it. Be plenty of people there. Uh, Robbie's going to be speaking maybe Saturday night or Sunday night. We're not sure which one. We're still trying to get it all out there. So come to all three <laughs> so you get to catch everybody. Uh, Pastor Dana Coverstone but, uh, is going to be there Friday night at 6 p.m. And then Saturday and Sunday uh, at the Cox Toyota in Burlington, it's going to be at 5 p.m. And, and we're going to have a blast. If not for God. If not for God. All right. For my YouTube channel, If Not For God with Mike Zwick. Just like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll be alerted when we have our next video. This is the Truth Network.